Outlook on America presented by Comerica Bank. We are so glad to be back and we are so glad you could join us. We're here today to take a look at the current economic and market situation, including the factors that are affecting the numbers and where we stand today, as well as to discuss the forecast for the future. I'm Eva Saha, happy to be joining the Comerica team as your moderator and host today. Now, as you know, it's been several months since we've held an Outlook on America and so much has changed. Today, we'll be sharing some very interesting information as the economy and markets are feeling the impact of many factors, interest rate hikes, inflation, the situation in Ukraine, and of course, COVID. And to help relay, break down, interpret all of this information, I am joined today by Bill Adams and John Lynch. Bill Adams, Comerica's Senior Vice President and Chief Economist, leads Comerica's economics department, providing a research and analysis that impact the bank's key markets, as well as business leaders and policymakers throughout the country. Bill joined Comerica just this year and is known as an expert financial forecaster. In fact, his exchange rate forecasts have been ranked in the 90th percentile of Bloomberg's forecast accuracy ranking. Welcome to the program, Bill. Thanks, Eve. It's good to be here. John Lynch, Comerica's chief investment officer, Wealth Management, is responsible for investment strategy, asset allocation, and portfolio management. He's also the chair of the Wealth Management Investment Policy Committee. Prior to joining Comerica, John held similar senior investment roles with LPL Financial and Wells Fargo Private Bank. John, it is so nice to have you here with us. Thank you, Eva. Delighted to be here. Well, it's wonderful to have this audience with both of you today, but I also wanted to let everyone know on the platform, in case you didn't, that Bill and John post weekly updates on the economy and the markets respectively. Just search their names on the website to get the latest and the greatest. It's a really helpful tool to help navigate through all of these tumultuous times we're going through. All right, we have a lot to unpack, so let's get right to it. First, we're going to hear from Bill Adams. Bill, the floor is yours. Thanks, Eva, um, and welcome again, everyone. It's really nice to be here with you. So uh, the economy today is in a, uh, a really remarkable point of transition. Uh, so in 2020, we had the, the deepest downturn on record for, uh, for the United States economy. Uh, and then in 2021, we had the fastest recovery on record for the economy. So uh, the unemployment rate shot up to near 15%. Um, by the beginning of this year, uh, it was back under 5%. Um, and uh, real GDP recovered even faster back to the pre-crisis level uh, by the middle of 2021. Um, so if you're sick of hearing about unprecedented uh, economic developments, I, I guess I have good news to you, for you in that the, um, the recovery is over. Uh, we're past the recovery phase of this business cycle, uh, and we're on to uh, what I think of as the expansion phase of the cycle. So uh, the, uh, again, real GDP is already back up, up to where it was prior to the recession, uh, and we now have the highest job openings on record. We have the lowest level of unemployment insurance claims uh, going back to uh, the, the early 1970s. Um, and uh, by many other measures, the economy is uh, the, the, the tightest, hottest running economy uh, that the US has had uh, in many, many decades. Um, so uh, with that being the case, uh, the question has stopped being, when are we gonna get back to normal and more what is the economy going to look like in this next expansion? Uh, obviously, the, the, um, uh, <clears throat> with, with economic growth back to more normal and, and you know, Comerica's economic forecast is that we will see real GDP growth moderating from 5.6% uh, in year-over-year -year terms at the end of last year to something more like 2% uh, in year-over-year -year terms at the end of this year. Uh, the, the bigger question is what's going to happen to inflation? Uh, inflation has shot up to uh, the highest in over 40 years in early 2022. Uh, and this is a combination of uh, a number of things that have just gone wrong uh, over the course of the economic recovery. Uh, first, we had the turmoil in supply chains uh, in early 2021, which caused prices of new and used cars to skyrocket, uh, as well as prices of other durable consumer goods. Uh, and then we just had a wave of really strong consumer demand uh, that recovered much, much faster than the supply side of the economy uh, and has driven up prices of many other goods and services across the economy, like uh, housing, uh, like services, like food services. Um, and that's been exacerbated by very rapid growth of wages 
um, uh, which is uh, a knock-on effect of the very tight labor market. Uh, people who left the pandemic, left the labor market during the pandemic, have been uh, slower to return um, than than consumers have been uh, to return to stores and and to other uh, spending venues. Uh, so uh, all of that was compounded at the beginning of this year when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, which sent uh, gasoline prices in the United States jumping another nearly 20%. Uh, in the month of March. Uh, and uh, we have seen gasoline prices uh, dip a little bit in April, and now uh, they're edged up a little uh, again in the month of May. So um, inflation is running very hot in the United States economy right now, but we are starting to see uh, some, uh, some light at the end of the tunnel, I think. Uh, if you think of the drivers of inflation as being in part due to supply chain disruptions, the supply chain looks uh, in considerably better shape than it did in the second half of last year. We've seen businesses make big additions to inventories, uh, both in the fourth quarter of 2021, as well as in the first quarter of this year. Uh, and business surveys are showing that they're seeing fewer delivery delays. Uh, they're seeing less, uh, uh, less need to build inventories. Uh, and their perceptions of their customers' inventories for businesses that serve other businesses uh, is that customers in general have stronger inventories and, and uh, fewer shortages uh, than they had in, in the, worst, uh, the worst months of the, the inventory backlog uh, last year. So that should be fueling a slowdown in uh, durable goods inflation over the next few months. Uh, and I think um, that will be the beginning of a slowdown in inflation that I expect to proceed gradually over the rest of 2022 uh, and into 2023. But even so, inflation's way too high, uh, and the unemployment rate is uh, within a hair's breadth of the lowest in over 50 years. Uh, and so it's, it's no surprise that uh, monetary policy is tightening. Uh, the Fed flooded uh, financial markets with liquidity uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, to ensure that the turmoil of, uh, in, in stock markets and in debt markets in early 2020 uh, didn't turn into another impediment to the economic recovery or, or make the economic downturn even worse than, than it was going to be. Um, so the, the Fed's uh, cut interest rates to near zero, uh, expanded the size of its balance sheet from about $4.2 to nearly $9 trillion uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, but given that the economy has, uh, has basically recovered, uh, the Fed is now quickly uh, reversing course. Uh, just yesterday, the Fed raised short-term interest rates by half a percentage point uh, uh, to uh, setting their target at a range to three quarters to 1% uh, for the federal funds rate. Uh, and the Fed also started to reduce the size of their balance sheet. So uh, that uh, is allowing the government to, uh, the federal government to repay debt uh, 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 federal uh, uh, U.S. Treasury bonds repay those uh, bonds that are owned by the central bank. Um, and as that happens, the money transfers out of the Treasury's bank accounts uh, and back to the Fed, reducing the amount of cash in the U.S. economy um, and uh, taking the extremely supportive uh, financial conditions and monetary conditions that we have right now uh, and uh, moving them back to uh, a more normal setting. So uh, that is where we are right now. It's a stage of transition back towards a more normal economy uh, and uh, hopefully an economy that will have uh, better controlled inflation. Uh, I think certainly one that's going to be growing at a pace uh, more similar to uh, our, our long run trend growth rate uh, rather than the breakneck pace of, of recovery that we saw in 2021. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Eva. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for that very comprehensive and insightful overview of the economy. Comerica is very lucky to have you as part of the team, and I love that you are exuding a kind of optimism that you don't always see with economists. Well, I want to be invited back. <laughs> thank you so much. And we're going to hear more, everybody, from Bill in our Q&A later in the program. So please put your questions in the chat. Let us know to whom your questions should be directed, because John is going to be speaking next. And so before we get to that Q&A, we're going to talk to John Lynch on how what all of Bill spoke of is affecting the markets. John, actually, I'm going to have you take it away. Thank you, Eva, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for participating today. Yes, Bill outlined uh, what's happening in the economy, inflation, employment, yesterday's Federal Reserve action, 
And uh, what I'd like to share with you today is really the, the market's in, interpretation of those events, because whether you're looking at the fixed income markets or the equity markets, it's important for investors to always appreciate that the financial markets are discounting mechanisms. And when Bill talks about the economy and inflation and interest rates with Fed policy, I think it's instructive for investors to take a look at the yield curve. Many of you are aware that the yield curve inverted recently. It's been flattening for you know, the better part of a year now. And we think that the, uh, the, the primary driver on this flattening of the yield curve has been the Fed's pivot on interest rates. You may remember last spring and into summer, the Federal Reserve was talking quite a bit about inflation being transitory. Well, unfortunately, as Bill highlighted, inflation is not transitory, it's tenacious. And the discounting mechanism in the fixed income markets, the yield curve, has factored that in. You know, we've been flattening for, for months. We inverted a few weeks ago. Uh, the inversion typically, and an inversion is basically when the two-year treasury yield is higher than that of the 10-year yield. Now, there are a couple of things there I think we should think about. We should think about a false signal. We can think about safe havens. We can think about um, supply issues. Bill talked about supply chain disruption. Well, there's a supply chain disruption going on with U.S. Treasury bonds currently, and I'll get into that in a second. First off, from the false signal, uh, I think the two-year Treasury bond does a great job discounting Fed policy. I think it's done a great job discounting Fed policy. The 10-year Treasury, from a false signal standpoint, quite frankly, hasn't necessarily priced in Fed policy until only recently, within the last couple of weeks. I suspect that the spread of the Omicron variant earlier this year, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, those two factors really saw a lot of safe haven bidding, right, which added to the false signal of the yield curve. Typically, when a yield curve inverts, it points to uh, recession uh, 12 months later, and, and we just don't think that's the case. When you have uh, sub-4% inflation, uh, wage growth of four and a half percent on a year over year basis and two trillion in cash on household balance sheets, real hard to have a recession in that dynamic. Uh, the weakness in economic growth last quarter had to do with trade and inventories, business investment, personal consumption were still strong. So we think the yield curve sent a false signal. We think the 10 year treasury only recently is beginning to price in the magnitude of 8% uh, inflation. And consequently, we think uh, the curve will steepen somewhat. We're about 30 basis points steep today. Uh, but nonetheless, in that environment, it is troubling for investors because what's supposed to be the risk-free area of one's diversified portfolio has certainly been, when we, the first quarter was the toughest quarter in 40 years for the bond market. So we think in the meanwhile, it's important to have some exposure still to the bond market. We think uh, treasuries in that three to three and a half percent range will start to catch a bid. I talked about supply chain issues. You know, federal government issued six trillion in debt, pandemic related spending over the past couple of years that amounted to about 10% of GDP, fiscal spending as a percentage of GDP. And uh, this year it's only gonna be about 2%. So we're gonna have a supply chain issue. We're gonna have less supply of treasury. So that's still gonna be a bid. So that's why we think there's gonna be a bid in that, call it three and a quarter, three and a half percent on the on the 10 year treasury. Uh, in the meanwhile, to, to hedge some of that risk in portfolios, we think there are opportunities with floating rate bonds, uh, senior senior bank loans, uh, high quality, if you will, high yield. We want to be as close to investment grade as possible. And then if we get to that three and a quarter, three and a half percent range, I think treasuries can play a more important part in the portfolio as will uh, investment grade fixed income. Now, moving over to the equity portion of discounting mechanism for the financial markets, we can't, can't deny the fact that the S&P 500 has been, and the equity market as a whole, has been extremely volatile. If you look at this chart here on the S&P, you'll see that the index uh, essentially went straight up since the spring of 2020. And unfortunately, when you have such we had 70 new records last year with no more than a 5% pullback. And sure enough, we've had a great deal of volatility. We're down about 15% as of noon Eastern today on a year-to-day basis. So we're, we're, we're looking at this chart right here. And, and I believe 
it's severe technical damage uh, when you have such a massive rally, yet the, the concern I have near term is that we never, if you think about a mountain climbing analogy, right? When you climb a mountain, you wanna set up base camp so you can acclimate to the, the, the new altitude level. When the S&P hit 70 records last year, we never hit a base camp. So we topped out at about 4,800 on January 4th, second trading day of the year. I'd like to think we have not hit the high of the year on January 4th, but that remains to be seen. We'll have to see how this plays out. I still think we're fairly valued above that before year end, but I'll get into that in a second. In the near term, I think we're gonna have more volatility. I mean, yesterday's 900 point rally was silly. And I think today's 900 point sell off on the Dow is, is similarly silly because it's just liquidity driven, fear driven uh, activity. And I think from a technical standpoint, uh, the market right now really needs to get to the 4,500 level to establish some sort of base that would be about the 200-day moving average or the average trading price over the past year, calendar year, if you will. Uh, we're, we're running into resistance, uh, 4,350 on the S&P. We're about 4,150 currently uh, as, as this call began. 4,350, 4,400 is about the 50-day moving average. Again, 4,500 we'll call it is the 200 day moving average. So that's a significant area of resistance. Could we test lower? I'm afraid we can. And that's something we all need to keep in mind because uh, I spoke to many of you earlier this year that during midterm election years, the S&P typically sells off 17%. We have an average drawdown since 1950 of 17% during midterm election years. Typically, that's associated with political nonsense, right, leading up to the midterm. Well, we've barely had a chance to digest uh, political nonsense because we've been focused on Omicron, lockdowns in China, inflation, the Fed, war in Ukraine. Investors have had many, many challenges to contend with. So I suspect if we were to see that average hit of 17%, that could take us down to 4,000 on the S&P 500. Now, during those midterm election years, we typically see uh, uh, a 17% drawdown, but once you hit that trough 12 months later, the S&P is up by a third on average. So I want you to think about that for a second. We topped out at 4,800 January 4th. If we were to see a 17% pullback, that gets us to about 4,000. And for those, pay, those investors who remain patient and adhere to their diversified strategic allocations in their portfolios, it's conceivable from the trough, call it 4,000, up a third, 12 months later, it's conceivable in spite of all these challenges, we could be hovering, if history would prove correct, we could be hovering at 5,200, 12 months out on the S&P 500 following historical precedent. Now, that's the technical outlook for the market. I would now like to focus on the fundamentals because technicals are more near term. Fundamentals tend to be more long term. If you look at the next chart, in spite of all the volatility, first quarter earnings are coming in better than expected. We've barely seen a hint of change in consensus profit growth for 2022 as well as 2023. So the earnings component still remains strong. Of course, we have to see what happens with margins as rising energy costs, rising wages, how that will impact corporate profitability. But thus far, companies aren't signaling too much damage uh, to margins as first quarter earnings season comes to a close. We'll review that over the next handful of weeks. And we'll, if we have to update our earnings forecast, call it eight to 10% profit increase for 2022. We'll do that. We'll make that adjustment on our mid-year outlook, uh, which will be released in the second week of June. So from a fundamental standpoint, think right now, 8%-ish profit growth this year. Uh, we've got a one and a quarter percent dividend yield on the S&P 500. Companies are buying back shares at the equivalent to which they're paying dividends. So if you think about a 1.25% dividend yield you think back, of, think of a buyback yield of an additional 1.25%, you're looking at a shareholder yield, if you will, which would combine the dividend yield and the buyback yield in a 2.5% pace 
of growth. So we've seen market PE ratio come down about three points. I think that reassessment of valuation has been very important as market interest rates are accelerating. Yet nonetheless, we're not looking for PE expansion to be driving returns. In this environment, albeit very volatile, we think it's important for investors to adhere to their long-term strategies, think about the power of compounding, earnings and income, and income really can tie it into not only dividends, but also that buyback yield that companies are doing. And if you're looking in that range, that's a total return opportunity fundamentally in that eight to 10% range. Perhaps the only thing I can guarantee you today is that it won't be in a straight line. And consequently, we think it'll be important for investors to adhere to their strategic or longer term diversified strategies. We are positioning portfolios to lean cyclically. We have had some defensive leadership of late, and I believe that's a part of the false signal from the yield curve. And we prefer that the cyclical recovery uh, be positioned for in portfolios. So we're looking at cyclical sectors, we're looking at value, we're looking at quality small caps to drive returns for investors. And uh, within those cyclical sectors, we're looking at uh, energy, materials, industrials, and the financial space. So. Uh, respect the technicals, but invest on the fundamentals. And we believe uh, as we get clarity, perhaps the most important clarity that we need is coming from Ukraine. And if we get clarity on Ukraine, we have a degree of clarity as to what the Fed is going to do. Now we just need to get comfortable as investors to what 8% inflation means and how we gradually decline that pace of growth in pricing, what that means for market interest rates and that how, how that is supported for the fundamentals I just outlined. So with that, Eva, I'd like to pass it back to you and open it up to Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. You know, really your wealth of experience and knowledge, um, no pun intended, I actually just got that, uh, but they really do bring a lot more clarity to the ever-changing global situation and how it impacts the market. We really appreciate you and we appreciate that you're going to continue to update us in those weekly posts on the website as well. Um, like you said, Thank I'd you. like to bring Bill back and get to as many of the audience questions as, the, as we can. Please, everyone, put your questions in the chat box and let us know to whom they should be directed. Just a quick note, our time is limited, so if we don't get to your questions, Bill and John, the entire Comerica team are always here to answer any and all of them offline, so just be in touch with us. Um, by the way, I've just got to say, there's so much engagement um, on the platform right now, and I want to thank you all in advance for that. Great questions coming in, so we are going to get right to it. Um, you know, somebody asked this of Bill, but I think that John and Bill, you might both have something that, to say about this. Where do we see the US dollar going in the coming year against the Canadian dollar, uh, the pound, sterling, and the euro? And I don't know who wants to go first. Don't jump in all at once. You want to thumb wrestle for this one, John? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to take it. If you want to start, I'll follow up. Uh, sure. I, I think um, what often happens uh, with the dollar is that the dollar will appreciate into the beginning of a rate hike, rate hike cycle. We've definitely seen the dollar uh, appreciating uh, into this rate hike cycle. The dollar is uh, uh, quite strong now um, against uh, most of those currencies. Um, but I, I think that uh, we're likely to see the dollar uh, kind of stabilize and, um, uh, and, and probably have much less appreciation or, or uh, over the next uh, 12 months. I don't think we're going to see uh, a depreciation of the dollar yet, though, with the Fed continuing to tighten uh, uh, monetary policy and, and reducing the size of their balance sheet, um, which I think is likely to, to weigh on the value of uh, emerging market currencies. Uh, John, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. The, the dollar tends to strengthen going into a tightening cycle, then pair back. Uh, uh, once the, the, the tightening cycle has begun. But I think it's important to recognize that monetary policy, the direction of market interest rates also plays into where the dollar is headed. And if we're thinking that the 10 year max is out in the three and a quarter to three and a half percent range, that's one thing. Another factor we have to consider is what, what, what's happening. You know, somewhat the, the question had to do with the loonie in Canada. Central banks are on disparate paths right now. You know, the Fed is raising rates. The Bank of Australia just raised rates. Uh, the ECB and the Bank of Japan are on hold. Uh, the Bank of China, People's Bank of China is actually easing. So there are a variety of factors playing in here. And I agree, I think the dollar, the bulk of the dollar's move has occurred. Like we believe the bulk of interest rates discounting, Fed activity is not done, but interest rates, market interest rates have 
factored in what the Fed is largely going to do. So consequently, the dollar is probably stabilizing, maybe slightly up over the next 12 months. But what the dollar will impact, certainly, you know, there was concern whether the, the dollar was going to lose its, uh, you know, reserve cur or global currency status, if you will, in, in the currency system. And I think after the war in Ukraine and you see the way uh, there have been safe haven bids for the dollar, confidence bids for the dollar relative to the euro and relative to the yen, I think those, uh, many of those concerns have been uh, put at rest. So uh, the dollar will play uh, uh, a big role in commodities as well. And uh, that's something we can talk about a little later if you'd like. All right, thank you so much, John. You know, a lot of people are asking questions about the rates, and, and so we'll get to Dave uh, in Michigan. Uh, Chair Powell was pretty specific when he indicated the FOMC would not raise the Fed rates by more than 50 basis points for each of the next two meetings. Has he locked himself in? What if the FOMC concludes in the coming weeks that they need to be more aggressive? Bill, um, what do you think? Uh, I think, uh, well, Chair Powell, he, you know, Chair Powell said a lot of stuff yesterday. Um, I think my main takeaway is that the Fed, uh, the Fed has the tools that they uh, think are necessary to bring inflation back down. They're going to use those tools. Um, the Fed sees the economy at maximum employment or probably over maximum employment right now. Uh, labor demand is, is certainly over the amount that the, the supply side of the economy can deliver in the near term. Um, and so I think the Fed is going to uh, continue to tighten pretty aggressively. Uh, I, I think, you know, if if Chair Powell could just kind of, um, you know, snap his fingers and, and make monetary policy exactly where he wanted it today, um, he would probably snap his fingers and have short term interest rates around two and a half percent, maybe two and three quarters, maybe two, a little under two and a half, uh, because that's where most uh, Fed policymakers think the level of neutral interest rates are. That's rates that neither add to nor subtract from economic growth. Um, but the Fed also doesn't want to freak out the fi uh, financial markets um, or, uh, or shock the, the real economy in the process of getting monetary policy from the, the crisis footing that they were on uh, at the beginning of this year to that more neutral setting. Um, and so the way that they they're are going about it right now is with these half percentage point rate hikes. I'm expecting another half percentage point hike uh, in June and again at the July Fed meeting. Um, and then uh, I think with interest rates, uh, then you know above 1%, I think the Fed is uh, going to go a little bit slower because they don't really know exactly where that neutral level is going to be that um, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, inordinately sl slow the economy. Uh, and if you think back to 2018, when the Fed had short-term interest rates at uh, you know under two and a half percent, over two and a quarter percent, we were already starting to see a drop in industrial production. We saw a drop in job openings. We saw uh, a drop in residential investment activity, which to me sounds like uh, monetary policy restraining economic growth. Uh, and I think that we're likely to see a similar reaction from the real economy uh, to interest rates uh, in this cycle, probably an even stronger reaction. Where we're already starting to see um, uh, mortgage applications have been slowing uh, in the first quarter of this year uh, in reaction to the, the jump in, in mortgage interest rates. Um, so I, I think the Fed is, is uh, you know, they, they want to raise rates quickly, but they also don't want to uh, unnecessarily raise risks of a recession, of a, of a hard landing. Uh, and I think they think that this half percentage point pace in the near term is uh, the way to balance those risks. Right, and Bill, just Eva, because you I, did mention something, about, oh, go ahead, John. If, if I may, please excuse me. I think a very important no, point that Bill made about the 50 basis point increases these next two meetings, this is a very shrewd play by Jerome Powell that is underappreciated by the markets right now, in my opinion, because the Fed has a lot of securities, 125 billion, 150 billion per month maturing on their balance sheet. So they're only going to roll off $47.5 billion in each of the next few months. So Powell, by raising rates, can send a signal to the market that he's serious about inflation, but he's going to have to buy back bonds in the range of $50 billion per month in June and July. 
So by buying back bonds and supporting the market, that prevents the concerns about tipping the economy into recession. So uh, I think it really is a very shrewd play that is underappreciated. And this is the time, if he's going to raise by 50 base points, do it these next two or three meetings, and then he can get back to the standard stair-step pattern of 25 basis point increases. Yeah. And John, I want to I want to start talking about China in a minute because there are a few questions coming in about that, and we can stay on together. But before we do that, just because you mentioned inflation, recession, where are we going? Uh, somebody wanted to ask: the GDP in the first quarter was down 1.4 percent. Aren't we at the beginning of a recession? And I know you might each have something to say about that, Bill. Yeah, personally, I don't think we're at recession right now. Uh, you okay. know, Bill's written quite a bit about it, and I'll let him highlight his thoughts. But if you really think about strength in personal consumption, strength in business investment during the first quarter. I think it was a false signal. I think it'll be revised upwards. And a lot of it had to do with trade. You know, we, we imported more than we exported and uh, a lack of inventory buildup. You know, real hard to have recession with, with a sub 4% uh, unemployment rate, one or you know, 2 trillion in cash on, on balance sheet. So we think there'll be a revision, or at least I think there'll be a revision upward. And uh, as, as Bill has highlighted, uh, second quarter is getting off to a good start, and I'll I'll pass the baton over to Bill. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Um, I, yeah, I I would just add to that um, uh, that we also added over one and a half uh, million non-farm payroll jobs in the first quarter, um, and uh, you just you don't usually see that kind of job growth in an economy that's in recession. You know, recession uh, is the the uh, you know, shorthand for it is you look for two consecutive quarters of falling GDP. Uh, but a, a more precise measure of recession is you want to see the economy contracting and you want to see that contraction uh, uh, across multiple measures of the economy. So not just GDP, you also want to see uh, incomes falling, uh, you want to see employment falling, uh, and you want to see production falling. And um, on those measures of the economy, uh, the, uh, we, we saw continued growth in the first quarter, uh, and I think that uh, we're going to see the, those kind of wonky things that drove a, a negative GDP print for the first quarter, like the trade deficit uh, and like inventory accumulation. They're going to be less of a drag on the economy in the second quarter, and I expect to see real GDP return to positive growth. Okay, thanks. You know, I would love for you to both stay on because there's a couple of questions about China and you all have hinted at a lot of things. It seems like you already are anticipating these questions from people. Um, but one person asked, um, will Chinese COVID-19 policy with the lockdown, excuse me, um, let's see here, sorry, uh, with the lockdown impact US inflation and the US supply chain? And then somebody else wanted to know if the Biden administration agrees to lower or eliminate the tariff on Chinese imports, what impact will this have on in inflation? So if you could just both speak to that, let's have a little bit of conversation around China. Um, well, you wrote, you wrote the book, Bill, so I'll let you go first. Literally. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, <laughs> I, I think... <laughs> I, I think the Chinese lockdowns are, they're bad news for supply chain normalization. They're bad news for inflation. Um, they're bad news for the global economic outlook. Uh, but uh, one thing that I've learned over the years watching Chinese economic policy is that, you know, it's like my grandmother used to say about the weather in Utica, Utica New York. If you don't like it, just wait a few minutes and look again, because it's going to change. Um, the, uh, China's government also sees the the problems and the, the um, collateral damage caused by their lockdown policies. Uh, and I would expect over the next couple of months, they're going to be looking for ways to mitigate that damage and, uh, and minimize the amount that their, uh, their lockdown policies are affecting China's economy. Uh, and they're really going to be focused on the effect on the economy domestically, um, uh, the effect on, on incomes and on, uh, on uh, domestic output domestic employment, domestic social stability. Um, but because China is so integrated into the global economy, that's going to also mean uh, the lockdowns uh, over time, I expect to have uh, less of an effect on China's international trade. Uh, and I, I'm hopeful that we have a little bit of a cushion uh, to absorb the impact of these lockdowns, given the, the just the huge amount of goods that the United States has imported from China uh, over the last six months. And that a lot of that has gone into business inventories. It hasn't been sold to consumers yet, um, so that there, there's there's more wiggle room 
uh, to, for businesses to absorb uh, a slowdown in imports near term. Um, the, uh, the, Eva, I'm sorry, what was the second half of the question? Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm, my thing is, my we're scrolling. We're scrolling. Um, will Chinese? Uh, yeah, the lockdown impact U.S. inflation, and then tariffs. Um, let's tariffs. see. Tariffs. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, yeah, tariffs. It had to do with tariffs. Yes. Um, if the Biden administration agrees to lower or eliminate the tariff on Chinese imports, what impact will these have on inflation? I think in in the short term, uh, you know, uh, tariffs raise prices of goods. Um, they would tend to, uh, you know, a, a cut in the tariff would mean that imports would get a, a bit cheaper for Americans. Um, there's a lot of other mitigating factors at work. You know, if China's appreciate, uh, if China's currency appreciates after the cut in the tariffs because people are less worried about U.S.-China trade relations or economic relations. You know that could offset the effect of uh, of the uh, reduction in tariffs and make Chinese goods, uh, you know, prices uh, change less from from uh, U.S. consumers' perspectives. Uh, I think the the bigger uh, factor driving inflation right now uh, is the surge in energy prices, the surge in food prices, and that's really a Russia Ukraine effect. Um, and, and I don't think uh, you know tariffs on Chinese imports are going to affect it that much near term. I think, um, you know, a, a broader issue, if um, U.S.-Chinese economic relations uh, improve, and they're at a pretty low point right now, uh, then I think that um, that could mean that, uh, you know, American businesses would stay more engaged with globalization and source more globally, um, and, and that does tend to reduce uh, prices over time. It's disinflationary, you know. Obviously, with uh, other effects on the economy, which have been kind of uh, debated to no end over the last uh, last six years, and I, I don't think necessary to get into after all we've talked about them uh, over that period. But um, I, I think the real uh, the real issue with uh, inflation right now uh, is uh, on the commodity shock. Uh, number one, uh, number two on housing prices, which I expect to slow uh, as uh, higher mortgage rates and uh, higher house prices uh, price more home buyers out of the market. Uh, and number three on wage growth, which I think also is likely to moderate over the next year uh, as overall economic growth slows um, and as uh, more workers who've been sidelined during the pandemic, either with caregiving responsibilities or, or health fears or the effects of stimulus programs, what have you, as those workers come back into the labor market and labor force participation recovers, uh, I think that will tend to have a, a, a moderating effect uh, on wage growth and, and its inflationary pressures. All right, so thank you for that. And actually you sort of touched on, Vicki from Texas wanted to know where the housing market is gonna go from here. So thanks for addressing a little bit of that as well. You know, John, you talked about a, a diversified portfolio at this point, somebody asked specifically, the bond market has been turned upside down and equities remain very volatile. What's the strategy for asset placement given such turmoil? Maybe get into a little more specific. Sure, thank you. Within, within fixed income, you know, we've had, again, the worst quarter in 40 years. Uh, we've had a 40-year bull market in bonds that was largely uninterrupted until just recently. So I, I think some perspective is in order. Uh, we do think the bond market, again, I want to be very clear that we're, we're not being dismissive of the risks of recession. We're not being dismissive of Omicron, uh, the Russia, Russians, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. Uh, but we're trying to take a peek at what, what the market's interpretation, what the market has already priced in. And uh, when you look at the fixed income market in a diversified portfolio, it, it's very clear that uh, what had been a ballast for the previous 40 years, 159 quarters, uh, most recently, the 160th quarter, the uh, uh, fixed in component did not provide ballast for portfolios. But again, as we get to that three and a quarter, 350 on the 10 year treasury, you start to see that lack of supply, yet still see consistent demand on the 10 year uh, benchmark US treasury note. We do think that will again provide some stability for diversified portfolios. And within fixed income, again, we made some changes to our portfolios 
uh, we're, we're still looking at, you know, better quality, high yield. Uh, and for, for shorter term opportunities, we think that investors can take advantage of yield opportunities with floating rate bonds, senior bank loans. And again, as we stabilize in this three and a quarter, three and a half uh, range on the 10 year treasury, I think that will be another opportunity for more improved quality. You know, we've certainly seen a bid on the tax exempt space. And I think you'll start to see some stability on, on the investment grade space as well, given uh, certainly, you know, they've, they, they got hit real hard last quarter, but I do think investors as investors discount the fact that uh, we don't have recession forecast, then the, the likelihood of default rates decline. So the higher quality, high yield bonds do well. And I think you'll see more stability on uh, high quality credits in the investment grade space, uh, intermediate terms. Right, and if all else fails, just call John, right? That's right. Good. It's a You're labor right. of love. I'm happy to help whenever I can. For ongoing investment advice. You know, a couple of people are asking the questions about the labor market. So what's the labor participation rate, if you all know, and how many workers really are on the sidelines right now? Uh, I, I want to say that we're back to 62.4, 62.5% of, um, yep. And uh, prior to the pandemic, we were over 63% uh, of, uh, of uh, U.S. adults were either in a job or were actively searching for a job. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of uh, challenges in, in measuring what's going on in, uh, in the labor market. Um, I, I think the most direct measures, uh, the, the easiest kind of most concrete ones is, you know, who is in a job right now and how do those numbers compare to where we were back in January and February of 2020. Um, and the level of employment right now uh, for um, men ages 25 and higher uh, and for, uh, 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 for men and women ages 16 to 19, and these are the, the demographic blocks uh, that uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, reports on, um, employment in those demographics is actually higher than it was pre-pandemic. Um, the areas of, of the labor market where we don't see employment back up to pre-pandemic levels, and you see similar, uh, similar trends if you're looking at the share of labor force participation, uh, is um, men and women between the ages of 20 and 25, uh, and, and women uh, uh, ages 25 uh, and higher. Uh, and I think women 25 and higher, that's very consistent with the, um, uh, the uh, caregiving shortage that we've seen in the United States. We've had uh, an ongoing decline in the number of uh, uh, workers in nursing and residential care facilities in the U.S. Um, and women are, you know, when there are uh, caregiving uh, burdens in households that go up, that traditionally falls to women. Um, and so that has uh, pulled a lot of women from the workforce, as had, um, uh, you know, the first remote education and uncertainty about when schools were going to lock down. Uh, so a, a lot of women who um, would have been working, um, would have wanted to return to work earlier in, in the, the pandemic, are, are only uh, making that change now. Um, between 20 and 25, I think that's a story of, of students going back to colleges uh, as uh, campuses reopen. So that's still room for labor force participation to rise in short. Okay, great. There's been so much conversation around the great resignation, reinventing, you know, how people employ people. Uh, why don't we close on this topic of labor because somebody else had a very interesting question. Um, what are your thoughts on former UK central banker, Charles Goodhart's predictions that the era of inexpensive labor is giving away two decades of worker shortages due to shifting demographics, increasing labor costs in low cost countries, increasing geopolitical risk, leading to declining globalization and more unshoring, et cetera. So um, it's kind of a loaded question, but why don't we end this conversation for today at least, uh, talking a little bit about labor? I think the, the you know, globalization has certainly been damaged over the past several months, right? And I think you're gonna see a pattern uh, to your point about onshoring. So uh, you, you could see elevated wage pressures as a result of that. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, diploma diplomacy, you know, will we'll make improvements over the, in the coming months. But nonetheless, there has been damage, even as, as Bill, you know, alluded to earlier about the last six years about tariffs. Uh, you know, globalization trends over the past couple of decades, we think are going to moderate uh, in the coming years and, you know, to the degree that results in higher wages. I think that, you know, a market implication from there could be 
slightly elevated inflation, therefore slightly elevated market interest rates, not from where we are now, but from where we've been when the Fed was artificially suppressing longer term interest rates and ultimately what that will mean for margins. You know, margins historically average, I don't know, call it six or 7%. And we've been in the you know, 11, 12, 13% range over the past six or eight quarters. So I think margins will get hit as you see uh, wage growth persist higher, but nonetheless, if margins go from 12% to 10%, uh, it's still a pretty good margin pace, right? Relative to history. And I think that's why, you know, it's a primary reason why I want investors to start thinking about earnings and income compounded annually, earnings and shareholder yield as I identified that uh, as opposed to PE expansion, because if you're gonna have elevated wages, elevated inflation relative to uh, what we've had over the past decade or so, uh, we still think inflation can moderate to historical averages in that three and a half or 4% range. And consequently, what that impacts for margins, we can still see margins averaging uh, you know, in that eight to 10% range as opposed to the six to 8% range. So uh, you know, there'll be an adjustment, but uh, wages will play a role. Thanks so much, John. Great point. Uh, how about you, Bill? Any last thoughts? Oh, I think John nailed it, and I know everyone wants to to get on with with the rest of their day. I, I won't. I, I'll I'll say more at our next webinar. I'll leave it there. And that that is a great segue. Thank you so much, Bill and John, for sharing your time, your expertise with us. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined the platform. We really appreciate your attendance. Your engagement was amazing. Um, we have a small ask of all of you. We do have a short survey for you to complete before you leave the platform. It just really helps us bring you the program that you want and the ways in which you need it. So thank you in advance for filling out the survey. We really appreciate that. And as Bill just said, we look forward to seeing you again at the Fall Comerica Bank Outlook on America Economic Investment and Midterm Elections Political Analysis Update. That'll be on Thursday, September 15th. Bill and John will be back as he promised, and they will be joined by Comerica's Director of Government Relations, Dan Donahoe. Until then, everyone, be well, be safe, and we look forward to connecting with you soon.